I hate when somebody pronouncing my name wrong. No, no, you got it right. <laughs> Dr. Tracy Craybill is Harvard Community College's eighth president, leading Central New York's second largest undergraduate college with nearly 13,000 students. 554 part-time faculty and staff and 460 adjutant faculty members and an annual operating budget of $78 million, founded in 1962. I'm sure a lot of you remember where it started down in the top class. Okay, what a, really a simple blessing it was for, for people who had that foresight to say, we need a community college. They probably saw it in other towns and maybe in other parts of the state, I would imagine, that was the ferment of their idea, but it came here and you know what it is today. Onondaga, uh, Onondaga College is a two-year operating under the State University of New York SUNY system and is locally sponsored by Onondaga County. Dr. Craig will straight that all out, how that's why it's important. Onondaga Community College is a 280-acre main campus located on scenic Onondaga Hill, approximately four miles from the city of Jersey. The campus includes eight academic buildings, a state of the SRC arena. They're having parties up there, you won't believe. <laughs> huh? We are? <laughs> you know about them? Maybe they'll invite me. <laughs> I'll put the word. Okay. I mean, there's Barbissa parties going on up there. <laughs> From what I understand, people we live here. Um, if there's an athletic complex, and the athletics there in certain divisions are champions, they're doing some wonderful things. They are, they have 50 programs of study, bachelor's, master's, and doctoral degrees available on campus through its regional higher education and 80 transfer agreements, which is a subject that you and I have been doing chat about, which is a very interesting uh, sidebar to just plain education. It's a, it's a management maneuvering the way they've got this transfer thing set up. The college also offers extensive community education and workforce development programs including classes for professional and personal development, customized training for local businesses, and special programs for small businesses, for children and teens, and other important audiences. College strives to provide the full college experience and program which enrich student life. You think I made all this up? <coughs> you don't have this week. The Arts and Cross Campus Program offers a year-round schedule of arts and cultural activities for students, faculty, and staff in the community. Avangarda offers an intramurals program of 50 intercollegiate men's and women's athletic teams, including seven high NJCAA national champions, and the prize of two times NJCAA national champion women's lacrosse, and prior to joining Avangarda Community College. Dr. Craig will serve. From 2006 to 2013, as president of the Rantan Valley Community College in New Jersey, where accomplishing accomplishments including setting record student enrollment, obtaining a $4.6 million federal grant from the U.S. Department of Labor to train workers in career paths. <coughs> Earning national awards for its service learning program. Becoming the first community college in the country sign an environmental stewardship agreement with the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency. We selected one of the 30 community colleges nationwide for the Achieving the Dream, for Achieving the Dream 2011 cohort, adding several <coughs> academic degrees and certificate programs. She is also <coughs> the president of the College of the Redwoods in Eureka, California, in Cape Fear. <laughs> <laughs> I grew up in so you do know, you do yeah, yeah, you Yep, absolutely. And acting president and dean of learning and special and student development at Queens Bow Valley Community in Danielson, Connecticut. Division chair of the academic development and learning support of Dartek Community College 
Good morning. Good morning. Um, it's really a pleasure to be here. I always enjoy uh, getting off campus, spending some time in the community, and having a chance to talk about Onondaga Community College. I'm really proud not only of OCC, but of the history of community colleges in the state of New York. And actually, my own personal uh, story is really, if I'd have to wind it back to the 70s to say, the opportunities that I had as a student going to Skidmore really started because when I was in high school, my mom went back to school at Hudson Valley, uh, which is a community college in Rensselaer County. When she finished high school, um, she wanted to go to college, but she may as well have wanted to fly to the moon. Um, there was no money for that, and so she went to work and never lost the idea that at some point she wanted to get some further education. So when the last of us went to full day school. Uh, my mom announced at dinner it was her time, and uh, that's how I learned to cook. Uh, that was my job. I took over dinners, and she went to Hudson Valley Community College, where she became a registered nurse. And that changed what was possible for me and for my sisters coming after. It also changed how my mother thought about college and women. She had waited almost 25 years, um, and she was, um, can I say hell bent in this room? Yeah, she, she was hell-bent that my sisters and I would not wait 25 years, that we would get off uh, out of high school, go straight to college. And, and I see that phenomenon every time I have a graduation at a community college. I see a family changing positions. And what I've learned over time is that community colleges help families to move ahead and families don't go backwards. So that gets me up every morning, gets me going to work makes me very proud of the work that community colleges do. And I really thought I would start by um, sharing with you um, a little bit about OCC. You got some good information in the introduction, um, but I find that unless you've been to a community college or somebody you know has, sometimes they're kind of a mystery. So I wanted to talk a little bit about our mission, what we do, um, what kinds of programs we offer, um, and why, and then save lots of time for your questions so that I make sure I talk about the things that brought you out here this morning. Um, as was mentioned, we're almost 13,000 students. Um, that includes students in our local high schools who may be taking a course to get ahead. Uh, almost every high school in Onondaga County participates with OCC so that those students in the 12th grade who are ready to go but are still finishing up high school, can within the day, within their high school, take a college course. Um, <coughs> they get the credit transcripted and they can take it with them, whether they come to OCC or go to Oswego or SU or anywhere else. And we do that because we believe it helps students get ahead. It helps high school seniors uh, practice the kind of skills that are going to be necessary in college to learn a little bit about what that college classroom feels like because it is a little bit different and sometimes left to their own devices we know high school seniors can skate a little bit um, <laughs> so we want to encourage them to keep going um, so within our 13,000 students there are about 1,800 high school students that are taking a course sometimes two, sometimes as many as three over the course of their high school experience. 
We are the second largest college in central New York. SU is a little bit bigger. Um, I won't get too competitive with SU, but you'll notice when you look at the landscape of Syracuse, they're on one hill, we're on the other. So. <laughs> um, and we get our uh, local operating support. We get a, a generous uh, support from Onondaga County, and they just passed our budget yesterday, so I can say that they've done that for another year. Um, we also are funded through the State University of New York, and we have what I think of as a kind of a three-legged stool funding. So a piece from the county that sponsors, a piece from the state of New York, and a piece from student tuition. Way back in the day when the law was passed to form community colleges, uh, the law said that those should be about a third, a third, a third, kind of evenly split. Um, it doesn't quite flush out that way at this point. Students are paying about 60% of the cost. But we, we were always founded on the belief that students should have a significant investment in their own higher education. We all benefit from them doing better in their lives. They become better citizens, more successful taxpayers, but we want them to have some skin in the game as well. In addition to the operating support that we get from uh, students and the state and the county, our local sponsor, Onondaga County and New York State, have shared almost $100 million in capital investment in our college over the last 10 years. Um, they've replaced and renovated facilities that were originally built in the 70s, and they've also added some building space because we've had a huge growth in students. We grew 45% in three years. Um, and yeah, yeah, I missed that growth. I was in New Jersey at the time, but you can see it everywhere on our campus where um, we've had to, um, several conference rooms became classrooms, several closets became conference rooms, sort of making space for all these wonderful students because our challenge from the county and, and what our mission revolves around is making sure that students who come to us get the equivalent freshman and sophomore experience as students who go anywhere and that we do that at a family affordable price. For comparison's sake, to be a full-time student at, at OCC is about $4,050. Um, you can put another zero on that for many institutions in our area. So our challenge is do the same for less. Question? In that funding mm -hmm. process, what do you get back from your graduates in terms of endowments, uh, funding, contributions, and is that a, what you and I would call, let's make this thing happen, let's get it glued. So our current endowment is about $9 million. So if you look at Princeton, which is 39 billion, uh, and, and we're 9 million, we're a long way away from the big time in terms of endowment. Um, but we do get contributions both from our alumni as well as uh, our faculty and staff. Most of our faculty and staff participate in our annual fund. And we, we uh, are very lucky with corporate donations for local companies who want to support, and primarily our donations go for scholarship. Um, we don't have uh, endowed faculty chairs. We don't have endowed programs. Um, most of the money that we raise, we give out about $300,000 a year in direct scholarship aid because part of our mission, again, is to make sure that whoever wants to come to our institution, um, there may be lots of barriers in the road for them, but money won't be one of them. So we do raise money from alumni, faculty, staff, the community, service clubs, companies, um, and we do have the typical alumni outreach. But when I get into the mission, I think you'll see one of our challenges for alumni giving is that 60% of our students come to us so that they can get freshman and sophomore courses and then go on. So they're gonna be alumni of two schools. I have a development office of two. Um, you couldn't fit the SU development office in the suite where I have my whole leadership team. So, you know, it, it, we don't spend a lot of money trying to raise that money either. Qu yes, sorry, question. Yeah, um, am I wrong or do you now have um, like on campus housing for students? Oh, 
we were able to um, build uh, housing for just under 900 students, 882. Um, and some of those, about half of those students are Onondaga County students who um, want the full college experience. And about the other half come from uh, outside of Onondaga County, but typically within New York. And this year we had 51 international students, some of whom lived in the dorms, others of whom lived in apartments in town. Okay? All right. So um, I want to talk about our mission, which is really in four parts. And I think if I do this, it'll help you kind of figure out what it is we do and why, and maybe what we do that's interesting to you that you'd like to come over and be part of. Probably the thing people think of the most is our transfer mission. That's where we provide freshmen and sophomore, typically what you would think of as general education courses for students who intend to then take those credits and go to another institution for a bachelor's degree. As was mentioned, we have about 80 uh, transfer agreements. Those are signed agreements where we go to the four-year school, we have them review our courses, our syllabi, our faculty, the expectations, and they sign agreeing that English 103 will transfer to them as English whatever they call it. And this is a tool we use so that students can understand if they come to us and they want to go to Clarkson, we have an agreement that shows them exactly what you take if you want to go to Clarkson. Same with Oswego or Cortland or SU or Lemoyne or you know the other 76 places where we have signed transfer agreements. That doesn't mean those are the only places that students can go. Um, all SUNY schools have uh, an understood transfer relationship with one another. Um, and what we find, bless you, what we find is that um, for OCC grads, the, they're very in demand with the private institutions. That um, we have, uh, I'm grateful for this, I've got a large faculty that produced these results, not me, but we have an excellent educational reputation. So that when students complete their degree at OCC, uh, private and, and local public colleges understand that those students are prepared. And if you look at the research on our graduates, and we track them after they leave us, um, if our student transfers to, say, SU or Oswego, they have the same chance of graduating from that institution in the same time frame with the same kind of GPA as if they had started there at the beginning. So we're very proud of our longitudinal research, very proud of what our graduates do, <coughs> and our transfer mission is really the place where community colleges started. Because the theory was that higher education should be open to all and everyone should be given a chance to try, right? Getting in shouldn't be the hard part. If any of you have lived with high school seniors, you know that getting in is the terrifying part. Well, for us, if you've got a, if you've got a high school diploma, you're admitted. For us, getting out is the hard part, right? Earning your credits, getting your grades, that's the hard part. And if you're able to do that with us, we're confident that wherever you choose to go, you'll be absolutely fine. Yeah. Doctor, I know a little bit has been confused with the concept. Explain to the, our group how the tuition numbers, dollar numbers, benefit, are benefited by the transfer program. So if you can imagine, let's say you want to go to, I'll pick a reasonable alternative, let's say you want to go to Oswego in high school. And uh, we won't even put room and board into it. We'll just look at tuition. You're going to pay north of $9,000 a year in tuition and fees to go to Oswego. You're going to pay 4000 to come to OCC. So your first two years essentially are half price. If you, if you want to go to SU, <laughs> yeah, you're going to pay $38,000 for your first two years. You're still going to pay $4,000 at OCC. So you can see we've got a whole bunch of students um, who, I'll tell you a story actually of a kid from East Syracuse Minot School District. His name happens to be Casey. So he and I got along really well. 
Uh, <laughs> he was vice president of the Student Association. And when he came in this spring, he was excited. He'd been accepted to SU in Cortland. He wasn't sure what he wanted to do. He wants to be a history teacher or maybe a biology teacher, but definitely a teacher. And he was trying to figure out what to do. And I said, well, well how did you think about how you started your higher education journey? How did you get here? And he said, well, over the course of my life, I love this, they're like 19. Over the course of my life, my family and I had saved about $11,000 for my higher education. And I figured out that if, if I came here and I had a part-time job and I asked my grandparents for books for my birthday and Christmas, that I could leave here with about $8,000 still intact and I'd have that to go toward my bachelor's degree. Great, great kid. Um, we have, we have kids who think like that, kids who understand that uh, it isn't free and that it's a serious business and that they need to think through. And, and so we get a lot of folks who, uh, who come to us first because of that. We also get a lot of kids who come to us second. These are students who got into uh, a college that they thought sounded great, um, two or three hundred miles away from home, and they got there and they weren't ready. And sometimes they weren't ready and they were homesick. And sometimes they weren't ready because they discovered beer. <laughs> and sometimes they weren't ready because they really needed someone in their corner encouraging them every day to you know, get up, get going, get your work done, remember the skills that you have. So we get a lot of kids who come to us second. And those are the ones that break my heart because those are the ones that are already kind of behind in paying for things. Right. Typically, they've taken a loan or they've spent a year of financial aid and they don't have the resources that they started out with. So I spend a lot of time with high school parents trying to explain what I think of as a value proposition, what, what it is you can accomplish by using us as part of your higher education plan. There are some parents who worry that doesn't sound really good in a cocktail party to say, oh yes, Johnny's graduating and he's off to OCC. But I can tell you, four years from now, when that kid's graduating with a bachelor's degree debt-free, which is our goal, get the students through debt-free, that the cocktail party conversation changes quite a bit. So for our transfer students, the value proposition for them is threefold. Number one, you go to a large university. Who teaches the freshman and sophomore level classes? TAs and graduate students, right? They're practicing on you. You come to OCC? Who teaches the, the classes? PhDs. I mean, it's a completely different experience. And the PhDs who work at OCC are people who want to teach. Do some of them do research? Sure, but it's not their driving force. It's not what gets them out of bed in the morning. So you have real faculty focused on you in classes of not 400, our largest class, 35. So close up education, this is why students who might have struggled in high school can be wonderfully successful at OCC. They've got the attention of people who do this on purpose. So that's one reason. Second reason, transfer students experience a good thing is they're typically not in debt. And if they're working to pay for their, their higher education, they've got a shot at making enough money to pay $4,000. It's very difficult as a young person to get a job that'll help you pay the tuition of, a, of a, even a state-sponsored four-year institution. And the third reason they come to us, and this is my favorite reason, is that coming out of high school, they may have been able to get themselves into uh, a somewhat competitive school. If they come to us and they establish a good track record, I, I just sent a young student, well, she's young to me, She'd say she was non-traditional age. She was 30. Uh, she's going, she, she could have gone to, you know, she probably could have gotten into to Oswego or Cortland when she went back to school. She went back to school after she had her first child. She probably could have gotten in there, but she came to us, was closer to home, saved her some money. She's going to Cornell free because she came to us and did really, really, really well. And because we can focus on you, because we have the faculty that are focused on you, they help our transfer students make those kind of connections. So the money's a great benefit, but so is the education and so is the network. And, and so that's what we do with transfer students. The second part of our mission, um, and this sort of gets um, fuzzy when people think about it, is we do workforce preparation. 
many students who come to OCC, about 35%, we're going to be, at least for now, the last degree that they get. And these folks are going to graduate and become registered nurses. They're going to become surgical technicians. They're going to work in automotive repair. They're going to work in manufacturing. Um, they're going to work in uh, electronics. It, they're learning um, at, a, at a collegiate level the physics necessary to work in electronics, but they're also learning the hands-on piece to be valuable to a local business that needs people with that skill. Now, it's about 30% uh, of our students. And for those students, same price, same small classes, same faculty who teach first, but those faculty also have the critical component of industry experience. It's one thing to learn manufacturing technology from a manufacturing engineer out of RIT with a PhD in manufacturing engineering. It's another thing to learn manufacturing engineering from somebody who also has a graduate degree but has worked five years or 10 years on a manufacturing line in a local company because they bring the real life experience, the same with our nursing program. All of our nursing program faculty have nursed the floors in hospitals. So they bring that practical experience to our students. So they get not only <coughs> the education and credentials that they need, but they get the guidance from people who have the work experience and can talk to them about, you know, what's it like when your supervisor wants to see you and it's not going to be a good conversation. How do you respond? Because these are young people. These are people without the kind of practical experience that make them right out of the gate stellar employees. So how do I talk to a supervisor? How do I address a question without feeling like I'm uh, you know, undeserving of the job? What's it like to manage the resources of a business if you're working on the automotive rep repair floor you don't want to go through three fan belts or timing belts, I guess now, to get it right. You want to get it right on the first one because you're responsible for the success of your employer. So our workforce development students get a whole uh, insight into what's it like to go to work in that field and they get the opportunity to meet local employers. So we're trying to um, smooth the path for them. They have internship experiences where they go into couple different businesses over the course of their two years to try out their skills for two reasons. Number one, to find out, is this really what you want to do before you spend a whole lot of time and money um, getting trained? And number two, if it is really what you want to do, what do you have to do to be excellent at it? We try to link them with the best employer that a, uh, employee that a company has so that our students are learning from the best. Our newest program in this area is a really exciting venture with Constellation Energy. About two years ago, uh, Constellation Energy came to the college and said, we've looked around the plant, and uh, the nuclear operators that are working at, at Nine Mile Point, you know, the, the average age is creeping up. We're going to have an issue over the next five years as people start to retire. We don't have trained people in this field to come to work, and we have an obligation, obviously, to keep the power on. So with the college, they developed a program in nuclear technology engineering. And those students are given a curriculum designed by the power plant and the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. They're trained in the skills on campus. And then each summer, those folks go to an internship to learn the hands-on piece. And what Constellation said to these students is, if you finish this program, we will hire you and you will start at $65,000 a year. So, you know, that's really, for somebody who wants a good job, a local job, a skilled job, a, you can't outsource that. It's gonna be here for a while. Um, th that's a great opportunity, and what we've seen in that program is so many of our veteran students coming back with the kind of technical skills that make them a great fit for that program. So our workforce development programs Little different from transfer in that students have a different intention. Little different from transfer in that we make sure they get the hands on throughout the program so that they have some skills to offer when they're finished. Um, same class size, same level of faculty involvement, and we think same uh, financial benefit. So that's the second part of our mission. 
third part of our mission goes back to what I said to you earlier, which is if you have a high school diploma or the equivalent, you're admitted, period, no questions asked. What we've found is that doesn't necessarily mean that you have enough mathematics skills or enough English skills to really be successful. So some of our students have to participate in we used to call remedial, now it's called transitional. When I started in, it was remedial. But educational programs that get you ready for college level work. And we've seen, for example, with some of the students coming uh, out of the military, that they have good technical skills and they're real interested, but they haven't had a math class in four or five years, so some of that's rusty. Some of those students start and we provide catch up, catch up math, catch up reading, catch up writing, to make sure that students have the kind of skills that will allow them to enter into the curriculum that they selected, do the kind of work necessary to succeed in college. Um, we also provide wraparound services, so while we don't have remedial physics, I'm not even sure there is such a thing, um, <laughs> we do have physics tutors. So if you come in and you really want to do this and you're willing to put the time and attention in, we provide you the support because that's part of being an open admissions school. We say everybody should have an opportunity. Well, it's not a real opportunity if there's no way for people to uh, get some help in building those skills. So remedial education is the third component of our mission. Um, last, I'm going to get you the number because it was sort of mind boggling to me. Last semester, we had 2,000. 944 students taking some kind of remedial course. So it's a pretty big percentage. Um, when we look into that, um, we find we're much like the rest of America. A lot of the students taking those remedial classes finished high school the June before. So there's a connection that needs to happen and one of our strategic initiatives for the next five years is the curriculum alignment between high school and college because we don't want students to, first of all, pay to learn something that they could have, should have, would have learned for free at some point. And secondly, we want to make sure we're providing our high school colleagues with the expectations of our program so that as they plant the seed with these students, freshman, sophomore, junior, and senior year, that they're building toward this concept of college ready. There's a lot of conversation in America right now about college readiness. It's all tied up with the Common Core. It's all tied up with all sorts of stuff that got linked to it. But for us, the fundamental issue is um, what can we do as a college to work with high schools to lessen the number of high school grads, recent high school grads, that need any kind of brush up or remedial. We understand if you've been out of school for a while, you might need to brush up. We think if you've only been out of school for a couple of months, that shouldn't really be the case. <laughs> because she wanted to see this place where she, where she got this <laughs> online certification. So we do have some students at a distance. Um, but most of our online students are also our face-to-face -face students. SUNY itself has started a new online program called Open SUNY. And the intention of Open SUNY is to take the State University of New York into other parts of the world. And OCC will be a part of that. Um, we think we'll have three degree programs in that. So we may now get our uh, online international students. And you're all welcome to uh, participate in our online or our face-to-face -face classes. What three programs do you think would be online? <laughs> so we think we'll have, and don't quote me because the chancellor hasn't said yes yet, mm -hmm. um, but we think the child development program, uh, we think the computer forensics technology program, which is really, it's amazing to me that you can teach that stuff online, but I guess if you're going to be a computer forensics person, you ought to be able to learn in that environment. What is computer forensics? Mm -hmm. What is it? So computer forensics is... In 200 words or less. <laughs> <laughs> All right. If you are working in my organization and we find that someone has subverted policy and put money in their pocket, these are the guys that come in and use your technology to figure out who did it. It's kind of like computer cops. Um, and then the third program escaped my... Business administration, yeah. Um, but it's up to the chancellor to say yay or nay. But that's what we've proposed, and they've said that three programs from us would be accepted. So. Are other schools going to have a mirrored programs in those disciplines? 
No, the plan of the chancellor is to uh, pick programs that each college specializes in, and those are three that we're particularly well known for across the state, so that they can build a s open SUNY that doesn't compete internally. Okay. Yeah. Um, we've seen a tremendous uh, change in technology in the last mm -hmm. 30 years, and this has impacted the delivery of education, for sure. Uh, can you just highlight a couple of trends that are new and exciting for me? Sure. I I'll tell you the one we're struggling with the most. Um, and and uh, it's really caused by the explosion in wireless and mobile technology. Uh, and it's got two sides to it. Side number one is, remember, we're all about keeping education affordable. So lots of the private schools have already said to students, when you start here, you must have this kind of laptop with these specs. We haven't done that. We still have computer labs all across the campus that students can use as part of their tuition. So one of our current struggles and questions is, what's the tipping point there? Wh when will this portable technology become so affordable that it's no longer the kind of barrier? And you might have to still have super max for your computer graphics people because those are still fairly expensive. But when will the portable <coughs> technology be within the realm of affordability? And the other thing that it raises, and my faculty, if, you, if they were here, would have a very lively argument about it in front of you. Um, should students be able to have their phones out and use it <laughs> during class to do research? Is it okay to be on the internet and checking something while someone's lecturing or no? no. Well, I've got about 50% in the yes column and 50% in the no and it's a very lively conversation and here's, the, here's what seems to be the dividing point. I've got a whole bunch of faculty who don't remember when there weren't computers. And so for them, if they, get a, if they have a question like, I wonder what this is, they, they're not going to wait. They're going to look it up right now on their phone or on their laptop or their tablet or whatever. And then I've got about 50% of my faculty who remember education before the computer and they think that's ridiculous. So it's, right now it's at the discussion level um, among faculty. The places where it's been resolved, interestingly enough, are in the healthcare fields. Where, where nurses are going to walk around the floor of the hospital with an electronic device in their hand. And so those faculty members are saying, phones, yeah, no big deal. They're going to have to be doing this all the time. Um, other disciplines, not quite there yet, not quite there yet. Um, the Have other thing that I think is, is uh, I'm, I'm channeling my architecture right, faculty right. now, they would say that technology has opened up their field to people who wouldn't have been qualified to do it before. <coughs> Um, because the level of accuracy you can achieve uh, in a technological, in technologically enhanced environment is very, very different than what a lot of people can do with a pencil. Yeah. Speaking of that health issue, has anybody been to a recovery floor at a hospital? I guess my nurses have. <laughs> You've got to see what's going on. If there's one computer at a station, there's 30. Yeah. <laughs> Well, you know, and it's funny because the other, the other field that the you, you could migrate to a, a, a notebook or a tablet or a, or a smartphone. Yeah, well, all, and all of our nursing students and all of our nursing faculty are out in the hospital all the time, so I'm sure that they're involved in that. But the other group that's involved in that are the automotive tech people. Um, you know, I used to love, I helped my, my dad forever when I was a kid. I used to love cars. You know, get under the hood, you know, pull out a spark plug. <laughs> you know, change a belt, change the oil, get all messy, right? I don't touch them now because they're computers. You, you open the hood and you're looking at it, you're like, I don't even know what these things are. Our automotive tech guys are online all the time with the diagnostic tools, right, to test an engine, um, to test the compression, test the timing, test the torque to make sure that the vehicle's performing right. So, you know, our workforce development programs frequently lead, and I think in the area of technology, our workforce development programs are, are the leaders. Anybody playing with Google Glass? <laughs> yeah, yeah my, my IT people, they play with all that stuff. Um, uh, we haven't yet had anybody ask uh, to use it on campus in any kind of learning. Um, it's only a matter of time. It's only a matter of time. Uh, I think it'll probably come from the geology folks because they're, they're out there. They do a lot of GPS mapping and they work with the social science people 
so that they're mapping the area, but then they're mapping in zip codes, they're mapping poverty by zip code, that kind of thing. And, and I think the Google Glass might be really an enhancement to their work. Mm -hmm. I'm kind of dying to get my hands on a pair myself, but I love all that stuff. Um, so fourth, fourth part of our mission, right? So we've been through transfer, workforce development, remedial education. The fourth part is community education. And this is one way in which community colleges differ from every other four-year institution in America. We have a mission component that says we should make educational opportunities available to portions of our community who can benefit and who are interested in that. So that's everything from working with a company. Companies will come to us and they'll say, you know, we're going to change our software program. We need to train people on the new one. Can you help us? Absolutely. We step in, customize training. Um, we're going to take over some hospital training with technology, those kinds of things. That's a normal part of our community admission. But our other parts of community admission is to work with social service agencies on things like parenting class, uh, drug education. Um, we have folks out in uh, all of the uh, neighborhood centers. We, we help with basic literacy. This area is rich with folks working in basic literacy, but the college plays a role. We play a role in GED preparation. Um, so on all ends of the spectrum, and then we have stuff that's just fun, like college for kids or culinary programs for the community who want to learn how to make artisan bread, or um, I'm trying to get them to do cheese making just because I think that would be really interesting. We've got so many dairy folks around here. But that kind of community ed, it's not extra for us. It's part of our mission. So we're always looking for uh, great community ideas. Um, I throw that out because you, know, you guys <laughs> seem to be a room full of ideas. And if you have something that you think OCC could be doing in your community, we'd love to hear about that. I had a fellow call me yesterday. He wants to do some lectures about tinsmithing. Um, he's a tinsmith, and he makes a living at it. But he's doing historic, re historic renovation of things made out of tin. Sounds fascinating to me, and I'm sure there are other people in the community who would be interested in that. So um, we like to provide those things on a uh, uh, cost-neutral basis. We only charge what it costs us to get it done and um, see that as a, a real community service. Yeah. How are you taking that community effort and spilling it out to the community mm -hmm. that is there? So um, I begin powering, powering that idea. I mean. I understand Casey Craybell going out and speaking to 30 people, 35 people in a room <coughs> that are not immersed in a daily economic, financial endeavor. But are you there to speak to the Qantas Club? The, the oh, yeah. Club, but those oh, yeah. I eat a lot of rotary lunches. Yeah. Um, <laughs> meet, meet with people. Yeah, I understand. I, but yep. I'm sure you get my drift. Sure. And, and um, I don't currently have a staff member who has that job, but I have an executive team and we all share that. So we're all out all the time talking with Pursuing folks. Pursuing it. Mm -hmm. Yep, yep. And, and a lot of people um, bring stuff to us. And some of it is uh, just the germs of a great idea. Um, and some of it is stuff like probably bigger than the college can handle, but we're happy to be a part and maybe help look for partners that can get it done. Um, when I when I got here, one of the things the county said was, you know, we have this jazz fest, and it used to be at the college, and it was great at the college, and then we had some construction, I guess, it couldn't be at the college. Could we bring it back to the college? Sure, sure. That's, a, that's an example of, you know, we're, we're a facility that belongs to the county, and we're, we're happy to welcome things like that on campus, so. It belonged there. Well, and it'll be good, it'll be good. And uh, July 11th? Weekend I after it was the week, I thought it was the 18th. Maybe no, it's it. the weekend after the 4th of July. And Frank is getting everything he wants. <coughs> oh, heck no. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. I understand part of the outreach is that, that uh, seniors can audit courses. Is this correct? Yes. Um, if you are interested in a credit course, the way it works is um, you can sign up for free on what we call a space available basis. So right before the semester starts, you can go online and see. Um, or if, you, uh, if you're uncomfortable in an online environment, you can call our registration folks and you can take a course uh, for free on a space available basis. Yep. Yeah. How are you going to 
So BOCES and the college are <coughs> great partners, and we have a couple of programs. Sometimes I have a feeling the programs you offer plus the program of BOCES works would be together. Yeah, we do. Um, we, we, we have a, Jody Manning and I have an agreement not to compete because there's enough need to go around and not enough money ever. So <laughs> we're never going to do the same stuff, um, but we will do an add-on for what they do or they will be a resource for us. So a good example is the physical therapy assistant program that they developed for high school kids. Um, it's for kids interested in going into this field. They do some work experience as seniors. They're actually, they've been working with the SUF athletes, so I'm sure they've had a great time with that. Um, but our faculty go in and deliver, because we have a physical therapy assistant right. program, our faculty deliver some of the coursework, and then when students graduate from BOCES, they can come to us with 12 credits in the bank. So we have that kind of partnership with BOCES. Um, a lot of folks have come to the college and said, you, know, you need to do right. training in the trades. I can't find a plumber. Well, I appreciate that, but BOCES has a great program. So we refer adults who come to us who want plumbing. We say, you know, go to BOCES. They're a, a great educational provider. The other folks that we have that same partnership with is the EOC. Because to come to us, again, for a, a program, you have to have a high school diploma. Um, EOC is able to do workforce training for people who haven't finished that yet. Um, so, so we try to find the place of best service for the individual client. Would you also, then, in the corporate trades, give them enough business background through your business programs that they will be able to understand a, how, how to do a ledger sheet from the rest of it? So students who, students who go through the trades program at BOCES can go through our project management program and, and learn that piece with, mm -hmm. yep, yep. Yep. Or they can transition them <coughs> into an apprentice program if that's the direction that they yeah, want to go. They can yep. Balance the two. Yep. Yep. Mm -hmm. I have a question. It comes up uh, periodically, but this is really, really, in my life, I work very great to point out we have a strong reunion. We can point out that and every time, every four years, you come up. And, right, and the discussion is when people go to OCC for two years and go to college, they don't have that connection. Is that a problem? So we, we don't have anyone whose full-time job it is to do alumni affairs. So yeah, that's a challenge. But the class of 64 is having uh, a reunion on campus the weekend of Jazz Fest. I think B.B. King got their attention. <laughs> so we're happy to facilitate that. And what we find is, um, you know, we have folks who come back and connect with the college, like our foundation board. <laughs> We have a ton of alumni on our foundation board, and those are the folks that tend to take an active role and say, hey, you know, I know where these people are, let's try to get them together. But it's, it's not something we pay to organize. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What percentage today uh, faculty are full-time versus adjunct or part-time? So the way I look at that is when I look at a schedule and I look at the number of sections, right? So what percentage of our sections are taught by full-time people? as opposed to part-time people is about 53% full-time and 47% part-time. What do you want? What do I want as an educator or what do I want as a I steward of public I resources? I would educate <laughs> I mean, really, that's the, we, we don't hire part-time people because we have a philosophical belief that we should hire part-time people. We hire part-time people because we're focused on how can we keep the access point, the price point, as low as we can for families and ensure the quality. So what we will never have is a discipline or a program without full-time faculty leadership in that area. Um, but when I look at 13,000 students and an English department, in order for me to have what I would consider uh, you know, a high-end faculty, full-time faculty, I I'd need to triple the size of my English department and that you know, on, on the face is not affordable. So our, our question is always, how do you sustain faculty leadership in the curriculum? How do you make sure um, that you have the breadth of the curriculum covered by your full-time folks? And then where do you wrap your part-time faculty around, around that? Um, in the workforce programs, you'll find that our, our full-time faculty uh, will choose part-timers who have different experiences in the business world. So in our... Uh, 
mechanical technology, you <coughs> might get somebody who's a fabricator and somebody who's a machinist and somebody who's a tool maker as part-time faculty. Um, it's more difficult in what I think of as the core academic disciplines. Yeah. Well, you can't